you lovely beloved saints I wanted to answer a question uh, for a viewer um, let's see uh, there this is commonly given to me it's about uh, you know how we got to be holy if we're if we're gonna be saved okay well you're you're made holy declared holy um, by the blood of Christ because it tells you you're sanctified by his blood I think your phone's ringing sweetheart um, and it's people misunderstand what a lot of these uh, warnings are for most of them are to Israel under the law about departing from their faith in the living God and going to idolatry fornicating or having adultery with other gods um, and the warnings are that he's going to allow the enemies to destroy them or be overtaken by Babylon or such and such or their their physical lives will be terminated or they'll have a famine or something like that okay it's never a salvation no one has ever been saved by keeping the law or any works that of righteousness they have done we're told it's not by works of righteousness which we have done but according to his mercy he saved us it's not of yourselves it's the gift of god okay so a lot of people and it tells you that the way a person interprets scripture tells you discerns his own heart it tells you how they see god they don't see God as a loving father that chastens for your own good so that you can be in his will and walk in blessing and safety. Um, they see him as a wrathful, vengeful. But see, he poured his wrath on his son for us. And Jesus uh, did that for us. So there is no more wrath for anyone that believes. It says that he'll convict, when the Holy Spirit comes, he'll convict us of righteousness. That's believers right standing before God by faith. The world of sin, because they would not believe, that's the sin they're convicted of, and the rest of their sins, because they're they're not covered, and it tells you all the sin. They that do such things will not inherit. Those are unsaved unbelievers and the sins that condemn them, okay? Um, it's not something a saved person, I mean, lying and strife is on there, backbiting, any, you know, gossip, all of it is listed, and, and none of us have ever stopped sinning, plus... It's not by our works at all that eternally we're saved. Now, there's terrible consequences for uh, living a life of sin once you're a saved person because uh, unsaved people may get away with it for a while because they're going to pay for it in the end. They're heaping up wrath for themselves, okay? But as far as saved people, you, are, you have trusted what Christ did. He imputes his righteousness on you. Remember, you're saved by what he has already done not what you do or continue to do or stop doing. Do you understand? That's how you can know you have eternal life because it's based on you've put your faith in something already done and provided. That's why you can't lose it because it's done. Do you see? You haven't done anything to get it and it's, it hasn't begun in the spirit of you now made perfect by the flesh. You started out with grace. You're going to keep it by your works. Come on. So I, I picked this section here in Hebrews where there's a famous verse that says, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. See, if you don't live holy, you won't see God. Okay, that's not what that verse means at all. The verse is actually telling you that if you're not living a set-apart life, a godly life, no man will see God in you. He won't know that you belong to God, that you're a person of faith. No man shall see the Lord in you. You see? And I can show you that here. Now, I have a bunch of verses here that's telling you basically that man is evil. Okay, you're not holy. You have no capability of being holy. When he tells you, be holy for your Father in heaven is holy. All these things um, are to Israel under the law for one. But secondly, uh, it is to show you the standards that you don't reach. Now, there's man's holiness, but that holiness will not save you. Just like it says, he who does righteous is righteous. But your righteousness is as filthy rags. It can't save you. So your holiness is a good thing to show others God in you, but it's not part of saving you because you can't be holy enough. There is none holy. But God, I will give you a few verses here before I read you this Hebrews now. Um, in Isaiah, it says, But we are all as an unclean thing. And all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. I mean, that's not even our sin. That's our good, okay? And our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. Every single person. There's no 
holy person. I mean, Isaiah said, woe is me. There's my, I'm a man of unclean lips in the presence of God. In the presence of God's holiness, you fall on your face. And if you really were in the presence of God, your mouth would be stopped by the law. You'd become guilty. And that law would be a schoolmaster to point you to your Savior going, I got nothing. I, I, I don't have anything to save myself. I can't boast in anything I do. Not my faithfulness, not how much I love God, not giving my life. I said before, what, what's God going to do with your life you give him except crucify it anyway? He's got no use for it except to, to, to give you his. You know, you're saved because he gave you his life, not because you give yours to him. Now, in Ecclesiastes, it confirms it again. For there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Man says he has no sin. He's deceived himself and the truth is not in him. Okay? Um, now, does that once you're saved... Then, you see, you've trusted, it says after, in Ephesians, it says that, that after that whom we trusted, we're the gospel of our salvation, we believe, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. How long? Till the day of redemption, till the body's redeemed. Okay? So, what happens is, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You are saved by trusting what Christ did for you. And now, your works determine whether you gain reward or suffer loss of it in 1 Corinthians 3. That whole thing about building on the foundation, which is no other foundation but Christ Jesus. Your works, your labor, it says, you can build on that foundation with your works and you shall receive a reward if that abides, if your works abide. Uh, once tried by fire through some trial of fire, because God is an all-consuming fire, or you can suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved. You see? So it's about on this earth what you endure. All right? You, God wants you in his will. He doesn't, because when you when you live in a bunch of sin and you're saved, you're a target. It destroys your victory. It destroys your witness, your testimony, uh, your feeling of fellowship and security, um, uh, blessing. And, you know, it, it, it just opens the door for Satan to destroy you. Like, it's just an open legal door for him to mess you up. So, let me, uh, a lot of what, like, Ray Comfort loves to use this. You see, it says, by your fruits you'll know them. Christians will be known by their fruit. The fruit of holiness. Nope. That's not what that verse means at all. Let me give that to you while we're here, alright? Now, um, uh, I just like to mention in Matthew 23, it says, And call no man your father upon the earth, because one is your father which is in heaven. Uh, I'd like to remind the Catholics, don't call any man your They break so many of the rules. Don't do vain, repetitious prayers. Don't do the doctrine of demons of forbidding to marry. Of telling people to abstain from meat is a doctrine of demons say, to, to be saved. There's all this stuff that is not uh, scriptural. And it tells you that your father in heaven is good. And then he tells you, you being evil. He tells you you're evil. You're not holy. You're evil and you can give good gifts to your children. How much more will your father in heaven give you? So that's another time where he's telling you you're, you're not holy. You're not good. There's nothing in you that's inherently able to please God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. That which is not of faith is sin. You can't please God in your flesh. You can't do it. By the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Well, it's not the law. It's obedience to... No, it's law. It's You can't please God with any of your fleshly works. Anything you're doing. You understand? At all. It doesn't make you... So when people like Ray Cover tell you you got to repent of your sins to be saved, they're telling you got to clean yourself up, get yourself well before you come to the doctor in order for God to give you his grace. Well, grace is unmerited. Okay? You can't earn it. And if you're working for it, the reward's no longer reckoned of grace, but of debt, and Christ is dead in vain. Do you understand? That's why I'm telling you, it says, let us not lay again the foundation of repentance from dead works. That's dead works of the law, and of faith towards God. God grants truth. Peradventure, God will grant him true repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Okay? The repentance is to turn toward. You can turn toward or from something with repentance. It's a change of mind. God repents many times. I keep explaining this to you, but the same problem is the connotation of the word repent. People don't realize that you got to repent of your sin. Nowhere does it say you repent of your sins. You get saved. The Holy Spirit dwells in you. He begins a work in you, okay? And if you don't grow in his grace through the milk of the word, because when you're a baby, you need milk. If you don't drink, 
you'll never grow and you'll remain a babe in Christ. That's a carnal Christian. And don't say, Paul Washer, like I said, there's no such thing as a carnal Christian. Nonsense. Paul said, I come to you as carnal. I am carnal, sold under sin. Then he tells them, I come to you as carnal, as babes in Christ, because they couldn't understand spiritual. So you listen to the Bible, not what sounds good, not mantras that if he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. Let go of sin and grab the, grab onto the Savior. None of that is scriptural, okay? It sounds good, but there's a way it seems right to a man, the end there are the ways of death. Now, I'm telling you this not because I don't want you to turn, turn your life around. You absolutely should, but you need to get saved first and born again. And don't bring any of that garbage into the gospel because it's another gospel. That's why I come against it. I'm not doing it to get you to not, to stay in sin. Do you understand? That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. I just know that once you're saved and born of God, he does do something to your heart and he begins a work in you. And you can't live in peace and joy and security and want to live in boldness about your faith, telling people this good news because you don't know what the good news is. And it's never good news to tell somebody they're a sinner and they got to start cleaning up their life. They want to get to heaven to please God. You better stop drinking. You better stop doing that. None of that saves you. You give them the good news. It's, it's news to be received. The gospel is God's report of his son is that he gives us eternal life and that life is in his son. It's not a list of stuff you do. Do you understand? All right. This is why I'm telling you this because I want you to rest in the finished work of the cross, then you can be excited about telling people what, why wouldn't you not want to tell somebody how great a salvation, how great a salvation, it's free, it's free, he loves you that much, there's no catch, or Robert Morris say, you're okay, it's free, it's free, it's a free gift, but, but, what's the catch, here's the catch, total commitment, really, where's that, he's taking verses out of, uh, uh, the, under the Old Testament. By the way, uh, Jesus, when he's speaking to Israel in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they were still under the law. He said, I came but for the lost sheep of Israel. He's speaking to people under the law. And he does imply that he is the only way and that he's going to be a ransom for many and he's going to lay his life down and save us. But the mystery of the cross is not overtly revealed until after his death, burial, and resurrection. It's implied. He even tells it flat out a couple times, but you don't really get it. Paul Paul tells you that he received it from the revelation directly from Jesus Christ himself. The gospel that saved us is 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Okay, I really want people to get this because you have to get saved first. Then you can have joy. Then you, you're not afraid to tell people the gospel. It's really good news. Who would turn down a free trip to heaven? And people despise it. Oh, you got your fire insurance, your your free ticket to heaven with your cheap grace. It wasn't cheap. It's free. It cost God his son, but it's free for you. And why do you despise so great a salvation? Why do you speak and trample the son of God underfoot and call his blood an unclean thing, despite the spirit of grace, like they did in Hebrews? That willful sin in Hebrews that you're constantly quoting. See, if we sin willfully after receiving knowledge of truth, no more sacrifice for sins. No, that's the willful sin you're committing. When you're denying the sufficiency of the once-for-all sacrifice of Jesus and going back to the law, they were going back to the law and trying to offer animal sacrifice. That's why there's no more sacrifice for sins, because he died once for all. He doesn't accept those animal sacrifices. And the willful sin there is going back to that and then denying the once-for-all perfect, redemptive, finished work of God's only son on the cross. And I'm sorry, but when... You say it's not enough and you got to turn from sin and do this or that to get saved or to stay saved. You are committing that willful sin and trampling the Son of God underfoot. So I need you to see these in context, okay? Now, the New Bible is really corrupt Hebrews, 1 John, and it makes really a lot of things hard to understand. Now, let me give you what the verses are about the fruit, okay? Well, first of all, the fruit of the Spirit has told us is about saved people. That's patience, temperance, all this stuff, self-control. But that's about spiritual maturity. It's telling you once you're saved, as you're growing in God's grace, this is what you should be manifesting so that others see that you are saved. Okay, it has nothing to do with uh, proving you're saved or doing these things to be saved. He's just telling you that that is the fruit of the Spirit. And the more you walk after the Spirit and not the flesh, the more you'll manifest these things. That's why he says, and these are the works of the flesh. So you can tell which which way you're you're living, working. You know, we want to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, not work for it. 
that that's only meaning we have to stand before God and explain what we did with our lives after we received that free gift. Okay, that's all it means. It means to be reverent of God. All right. So here is the actual verse about fruit. It has nothing to do with holiness of somebody's life. As a matter of fact, it tells you that these people will look like sheep, but they're inwardly ravening wolves. So they're going to look holy. They're going to look like just men. They're going to be self-righteous hypocrites that give you a false gospel. And the fruit here is their doctrine, their words, what they tell you, whether it's in accordance with the word of God or not. Okay, it has nothing to do with behavior because they can trick you with living in good behavior. See, because Satan's ministers come as ministers of righteousness. All right, so you don't look for over behavior to determine if someone is saved. No, a false prophet. That's what this verse is about. This little parable story, it's not about checking to see if they're saved people, all right? It's false prophets and a warning about them, okay? You don't randomly take little verses and change the context, and you get garbage like that. And a man was already saved, and Ray Comfort tells him, no, no, you think you might be a false comfort? You know, it's by their fruits, you'll know them. Fruits of holiness, and, and, and uh, yada, 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 all these other conditions he's saying. And, and it's unbiblical. It's not what it means at all. Matthew 7, 15. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Now, uh, this is, he's telling you this because their behavior is going to trick you. Because they're ministers of righteousness. They're going to look good. So then he tells you what to look for, what their fruit will be. Their words, their doctrine. That's what he's telling you to look out for. Here it is. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Now, why would he tell you they come to you in sheep's clothing if they overtly look like an unholy sinner? They don't, and it's not talking about that. All right. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Who do you, who do you going to know? False prophets. By what? Their fruits. What fruit? The words they speak, because outwardly they're going to look like a sheep. All right? They're going to look like a Christian. They're going to look like a real prophet. So you don't look for behaviors that are overt. You look for their fruit, their words, their doctrine, and check it with the word of God. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth bad fruit. Okay? None of this has anything to do with a say, and this is, and uh, there, wherefore by their fruits you shall know them. Know who? Oh, false prophets, not saved people, not checking yourself to see if you're saved by the fruit of holiness. All right, now let me give you, and I told you where he's saying your father in heaven is the only one good, and you are evil, and you can give your children uh, good gifts. So he just tells you you're, you're evil. You're, you're not holy in yourself. You can't do anything good. Without faith, you can't do anything. All right, so Hebrews here. Now, let me read this whole section, and we'll get to without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. This is clearly telling you that if you're not living this way for others to see, then no man's going to see the Lord in you, okay? And you'll tell it tells you that. Listen, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, so do you finish it and keep it by your good works and your faithfulness and obedience? Do you keep your salvation? No. He's the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. He's saying, look what he endured for you. Stand fast in your faith, your liberty. He did this. It's done. It's what he's telling the Hebrews here. You are saved. You don't have to keep offering sacrifices and trying to uh, be justified by the law. That's what, it's Hebrews, people. It's written to Hebrews. All right, and he says, ye have not resisted unto blood striving against sin. He's saying, but Jesus did. He did it for you. That's why you don't need to be weary and faint in your minds. You don't have to fear. Everything here tells you to, to be c confirmed that you're saved. I tell these things that believe in the name of the Son of God so you may know you have eternal life. And this thing says, that, and a lot of people twist this verse too, that if you could lose it, I'll give you in layman's terms, if you could lose it, then it, it, well, it says it's impossible to bring him to repentance because he would be crucifying the Son of God a second time and would put him to open shame. So, oh, see, you can lose salvation and you can never get it back. That's not what it's saying. It's saying if it was possible for you to lose it, that would mean that Jesus would be crucified twice. 
And that's not possible because he died once for all. It's actually an eternal security verse. You should be uh, happy about that. Now, I want to skip down. It just says, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. Now, see, this is about behaviors of saved people, okay? And what's going to happen? See, they're no longer, they're, they can't be believing they're justified by the law. Nobody was ever justified by it. And he's telling them, but what the law will do, your behavior will either get you chastened by your father or blessed by him on this earth, okay? And this is what he's discussing here. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then ye are bastards and not sons. He's saying, you're, if you are, are, are going this way, away from God's will, and away from his ways, then you'll be chastened. And if not, you're not a son, but you are a son. And he said, all are partakers of that. Okay. Um, a lot of these things are rhetorical. Okay. Now it tells you this. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh, which corrected us and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the father of spirits and live? Is that about uh, eternal life? No. See, when you're obedient to God once you're saved and you're obedient to him, you live. It says that sin unto death or obedience unto life. You see, I, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, paraphrasing there, but you can look that up. But that's about physical uh, life and death. Okay. And we can, we can die early. Some of those guys were uh, getting drunk and gorging at the Lord's Supper, not setting apart that as a a, a, a sacred event and, and not recognizing that and some of them had fallen asleep some of them had died and some had become ill it said okay here it goes now here's some more uh, instruction on uh, living right now because you're going to be chastened and here's some more instruction and here comes the holiness thing and you'll see where the context is uh, wherefore look because it warns about chastening of God your father's going he's going to spank you okay so it says Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Okay, here we go. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Do you see it now? He's giving them instructions, telling them you'll be chastened, that your dad's going to spank you if you're not obedient, but you're not earning salvation by the law, okay? Rest in your full assurance of faith. He saved you once for all, and then he's telling you, but you do, you should be living for God uh, uh, because you're, you're going to be chastised, you're going to be spanked, uh, you can even die. It says, choose, you know, obedience and live. And then it says, so make your path straight and, and uh, follow peace with all men in holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Follow peace with all men and holiness. See, he's telling him those men, if you're not uh, peaceable with them and living a holy life, a set apart life, you're not, your holiness is a joke to God as far as getting you saved. But if you're not set apart and living a godly life, that no man will see the Lord in you. Do you see that? You won't exhibit God in you as one of his. So I really wanted to get that point across because people just cannot seem to get it. I, I don't know why. But uh, in any case, love you guys, and uh, Happy New Year. Bye-bye.